Don't shoot, because I have a future. Don't shoot, because I'm a college student. But please, 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 please don't shoot, because I ain't human. And my life, 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 my life and my life matters. We need to give every child, no matter what they look like, where they live, the chance to reach their full potential because if we do, we'll start a different cycle. And this country will be richer and stronger for it for generations to come. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the Los Angeles Public Policy Council uh, network meeting. I'm D'Artagnan Sforza, uh, the Executive Director of the Social Justice Learning Institute, and pleased to be here with all of you today. What do the recent shootings of Michael Brown, Ezel Ford, Eric Garner, and so many other black men in this society have to do with food? What do these concepts of food, food justice, transformative justice, restorative justice have to do with food, and, and those of us who are in this space? That's what we're going to explore today. We're going to explore these concepts of restoring justice in our communities, and in the spaces that we occupy in Los Angeles. The LA Blue Policy Council is committed, to, is committed to connecting, catalyzing, convening, and coordinating action in Los Angeles. And what we've come to find is that um, these activities are critical if we're going to have a better food system. So again, we're going to explore these concepts today. Um, I'm happy to be here with all of you. Again, I serve on the Elected Policy Council. I'm on the, the leadership uh, 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 team, board, as well as uh, the council itself. And we are um, excited about having this conversation. Um, I'd like to lift up some of the team members, uh, Claire, Anisha, and Alexa, who really initiated this conversation amongst a number of community-based organizations in Los Angeles who are committed to addressing these issues in our communities. Today, at this very moment, there's a group of our, 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 our organizations that are meeting at Augustus Hawkins High School, marching to Bethune Middle School to address the recent killings and shootings of his own court. Food can help heal. Food has the power to transform. And food can repair harms. So, the question we're going to explore today is how can those of us engaged in the food, in the food movement facilitate a supportive and more inclusive food system for all? Food serves as a way to prevent conflict, repair harm, and heal vulnerable communities that have experienced many of these harms as a result of poverty. And in some cases, before, during, and after incarceration. Food security is something that may, maybe we often take for granted. Something that many of our vulnerable communities typically, uh, food insecurity is something that many of our vulnerable communities typically, typically face. When dealing with food insecurity and when dealing, dealing with some of the conditions related to poverty, we often find that folk have to work harder to survive. Sometimes, that sometimes uh, they're in uh, uh, low-paying jobs where they're dealing with um, unsafe working conditions, either with machinery in factories or in agriculture itself. Sometimes there's poor housing and living conditions. And often, as we've come to find, food, uh, vulnerable communities have issues related to, to diet and face other diseases simply because we can't afford or even have access to safe foods. So as we have these conversations today, I'd like to lift up some of the people that are in this space that have been doing this work in our network, people that are sitting right next to you, to whom you've not, uh, maybe you've not ever noticed before. I'd like to call out Community Services Unlimited. Please stand. A New Way of Life. Conservation Corps, Brotherhood Crusade, 
And I'd like to give a special recognition to Al Redder. Is Al here? So I got a call from my dad um, about a month ago. My dad is currently incarcerated. He's locked up in prison about 45 minutes from here because he's addicted, he was addicted to drugs. Um, and put in prison because he didn't, he didn't get to go through re rehabilitation. Often we find that folk in our communities get jail and folks in more affluent communities get Betty Ford, right? So he was locked up and, and so um, my dad calls me and says, hey, I met this guy named Al Renner. <laughs> He's up here working with us trying to help us learn how to grow food. And I said, well, how did you meet him? He said, he said, well, you know, I was having a conversation talking to him about what my son did and we connected over this relationship. And it was phenomenal, right? This idea that, that we can connect through food. So I really want to lift up Al and the work that he's doing with the LA Community Gardening Council. LA Community Garden Council. Before I get into an overview, we're going to take two minutes. We're going to do what's called a right pair share activity. Two minutes, one minute each, okay? You're going to take about a minute. And what you're going to do is you're going to write on the back of your agenda how you will be engaged in addressing these issues related to justice in the food system. Or how you are already engaged. You're going to literally take a minute to answer this question, beginning now. Now this is what I want you to do. I want you to turn to your neighbor. You each get a minute each, or you each get a minute, and you're going to turn to your neighbor, you're going to explain exactly what you just wrote. So you're going to take the first minute, you're going to share your story, you're going to share why and how you believe you can be invested in and involved in reshaping this food system, and then you're going to, and then you're going to pass it on over. So, identify your neighbor. Take a second, go ahead and identify your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> So at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Annalena Holt and Frank Tamborello. We're going to join our panel. So we're going to give them a second. We're going to give them a second to, to introduce. We're going to give them a second to introduce themselves. But before we get started, we're going to talk about this relationship between the food system, the food movement, and some of the issues that we've just uh, raised, right? Race, poverty, hunger, etc. This handout, which um, is, uh, uh, I believe, here on the side, uh, it'll be available for you. We brought about 50 copies or so. This handout represents this concept um, of restoring justice in the food system. Now, what do we have to restore in the food system? Can anyone answer in one word what you think we must restore in the food system? Okay. Nutrition. Nutrition, okay. Access. 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 Equity. Dignity. Justice. We have to restore justice, that's right. Dignity. Dignity. Connection. Connection. These are all correct. But in order to get to justice, and in order to address justice, we have to first identify something, and that is the harm. We have to restore people from the harms that have been done. There are harms that are currently being done by our food system. Harms that are being done to each and every single one of us. And I often use the term vulnerable communities for a number of reasons. Um, I don't like using words like low income, underprivileged, underserved, um, because I think they all represent sort of a deficit lens and they remove people's agency to do for themselves, right? Because we all have power. We all have privilege. But even recognizing that, we are all vulnerable in some way. Someone in a more fluent community living in Palos Verdes might be more vulnerable to a tidal wave, right? Uh, someone who's living in East LA might be more vulnerable to uh, power plant pollution. But we're all vulnerable in some way. So there's been harm that's been caused to us in our food system. So these are a few frameworks we're going to talk about that help to address some of the harm that's done disproportionately to people of color, but even to, to the rest of us. So according to the USDA, African-American Latino households face food insecurity and hunger rates at three times higher than those of their white counterparts. 
And often, Latino children confront rates of chronic hunger at 46 and 40% respectively than do white children who are at 16%. The disproportionate number of people of color who suffer from food insecurity and hunger comes partially from the fact that poverty is racialized. According to the 2000 census, 47% of those living in poverty are white, 26% are African American, and 23% are Hispanic. While the general population of whites make up 72%, African Americans 12%, and Hispanics 11% of the population. And what we often leave out are, are low-income white rural residents who deal with and face some of the same issues urban communities deal with as well. So these are three frameworks today we're going to be talking about um, that help to address some of the harm that's done in the food system as a result of poverty, as well as some of the broken mechanisms that have been um, uh, occurring over the, over the past five decades. Food justice. Food justice is a framework uh, that, according to us, my organization, SGLI, um, that articulates that communities have the right to grow, sell, and eat healthy food. That is, fresh, nutritious, locally grown, affordable, sustainable, um, uh, and do so with the, with the care, with care for the well-being of the land, the workers, and the animals. Food justice can help lead to some of, the, some of the solutions that can address harm that's done to youth and communities in general. Another framework we're going to rely upon in our conversation today is restorative justice. And restorative justice, um, restorative justice uh, specifically focuses on, the, on this idea of, of doing harm. Um, it is a theory that uh, articulates that victims, offenders, and community members can meet to decide how um, to address those issues. It's typically done in four ways. You encounter, you create a space for op and opportunities for victims and offenders to come together in the community to, to discuss crimes that may have arisen or challenges that may have arisen as a result of harm. And you do so in a practice that offers an opportunity for these folks to make amends while reintegrating allowing victims and offenders to reintegrate into society in ways that do not perpetuate violence. It becomes inclusive as you identify and take steps to repair harm and involve all stakeholders in transforming their relationship. And finally, transformative justice is another framework we're gonna be relying upon today as we talk about the ways in which we can restore justice in the food system. It's a liberatory approach to addressing violence. One that seeks safety and accountability without relying upon alienation, punishment, or state of systemic violence, including incarceration or policing. Both individual and collective liberation are equally important, mutually supportive, and fundamentally intertwined if we're going to achieve success in repairing harms. Transformative justice, in general, responds to conflicts and it's a practice that we can apply in multiple spheres, not just in the criminal justice system. So if you find yourself involved in a labor dispute, for example, transformative justice practices can help you address those labor disputes. It essentially is a systems approach. So, today we're going to present to you three case studies. Uh, one with Annalena Hope, who's going to take a second to introduce herself, as well as Frank Tamarello of Hunger Action LA. Uh, Annalena is currently a CSU board member and a grad student in American and Ethnic Studies at USC. Uh, and then I'm going to present uh, a little bit of background on our work in SGLI and the way in which we all use food justice, restorative justice, or transformative justice to address harms that have been done in the food system. Let's give them a round of applause. Second, and have Annalena begin by introducing herself. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yes, yeah. I couldn't figure out the mic. <laughs> um, so I'm Annalena. Thank you, D'Artagnan, for that introduction. I'm a graduate student at USC and a board member of CSU, and so I'm a scholar activist in many ways. I'm a writer and an activist, and I try to bridge the, the line between the two. Um, and I'm here today because I was invited to talk about a piece that I wrote last spring on food justice in the prison system and the prison industrial complex. So um, last spring, a group of colleagues and I put together this kind of amazing quarterly zine about prison abolition, and each of us took a different approach. So there's um, you know, interviews with formerly incarcerated people, there's 
art as a practice of abolition, and my approach was was food and food justice. And so um, one of the major things that stuck out to me while I was investigating food in the prison system was privatization and the fact that the food that for, that incarcerated people are eating and have access to is all you know connected to this multi-billion dollar industry, right? So one of the major industries is Aramark. Have anyone heard of Aramark? You know, they do like the airline food and the, the laundry services, and they're also really connected to the prison food. And so all of the food that is, is contracted in and kind of um, you know, uh, homogenized so that everyone gets a certain amount of food is all you know, provided by these private industries. So we have these multi-billion dollar industries that are profiting off of what uh, incarcerated people are eating. And generally what that is is really low quality, low quantity. Right, so you have grown people who are eating elementary school sized portions of, you know, bologna sandwiches, peanut butter sandwiches, right? There used to be this saying, three hots and a cop. You get three hot meals and a cop to sleep on. Well, you don't even get hot meals half the time anymore. These are cold meals, these are you know, these are things that if we're thinking about the way that the way that food interacts in our bodies and in our cells in this potentially generative way, if you're eating food that is you know, very low in nutritive value, you know, you're not going to, just like food in schools, if kids are eating hot Cheetos and sodas and they're falling asleep or they can't sit still, there's a connection there, right? So when we think about rehabilitation as one of the, you know, um, supposed tenets of the prison industrial complex, what uh, incarcerated people have access to is really not sufficient. Um, the other issue is, you know, you can uh, supplement what you're fed with these commissary packages, right? So your family can spend a certain amount of money, pay another private industry to send you a box of food, but even this is top ramen and candy bars and sodas. And so none of this has real nutritive value when we think about what real food is, right? And, um, you know, food as a tool of oppression is seen on this global scale, but within the prison system, you can really see how, you know, folks who have no other options, no way to leave or really advocate for themselves, are being literally tortured with food or with the withholding of food, right? So either not being fed in a timely manner, or um, I had uh, an interview with one incarcerated man who said that his, you know, the prison guards would come and they would put his tray in, and then as soon as he reached for it, they'd snatch it back or they give his whole commissary package to another inmate to deliberately start a fight between those two people, right? So there's a lot of really kind of um, inhumane treatment that's happening. And so when we think about humanity and who gets to be human, you know, a lot of the rhetoric is if you committed a crime, then you get what you deserve, right? You want bacon and eggs, you stay out of prison, right? And so that's the kind of, that's the kind of narrative that goes on, but really, you know, when we think about how most people who are incarcerated are in there for nonviolent crimes or drug abuse or things like that, then, you know, there really is a lot of work that needs to be done in just ideologically reframing who we're talking about when we're thinking about the prison system, right? You know, who are these people who are in there? How are they being treated? And what can, what can we do to advocate for them, right? Because we know that once you're incarcerated, there's very little that you can actually do other than hunger striking and refusing to eat, which is one of the main things that incarcerated people do to advocate for themselves. But as we see, a lot of that you know, goes on behind closed doors. We don't get access to that information. And you know, a lot of folks who are already sick and suffering wind up getting even more sick and, and potentially passing away as a result. Last year, you know, up to, I think it was two thirds of the, the incarcerated folks in Guantanamo were, were hunger striking. And you know we didn't really hear the outcomes of that because there's all these other things that are going on to distract from that. So I won't take up too much more time. But basically, the takeaways are that you know food in prison, the for these vulner vulnerable communities, the quality and, and quantity of the food is really you know is very minimal. And even what you do have access to, to my you know definition, can't even really be counted as food because you can go and spend you know a dollar ten cents on top ramen which again, low nutritive value, right? And when you're outside, you can get them 10 for a dollar, right? So everything is hiked up, everything is, is unhealthy, and you know, there's a real push now, and as I turned over to Frank, to do these, um, you know, 
gardening as therapy, food production as therapy, food to be reclaimed from you know, this, this oppressive framework and utilized instead to be a tool of real rehabilitation and real, um, you know, uh, engendering a real sense of one's own agency to produce one's own food, to take control of one's own health, and by extension, all of you know the recidivism and all of the other things that come from you know when a vulnerable population is then re-released into society with no access to, to jobs and you know EBT and different kinds of, of things that will be set up otherwise. So I'll say more, but that's it for now. Thank you. <laughs> Darthanian, thank you for the introduction, and thank you, Annalena, for that. And I especially want to play out something you said about who gets to be human, because that's the theme of what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about what happens when people come out of prison. Do they suddenly become human again? What does our society do? Well, I'm going to tell you about a policy. Um, just to give you some background, if you, don't, if you don't know Hunger Action LA, we work a lot on food policies, which it overlaps with the, just the general anti-poverty world. So we, we focus a lot on programs like CalFresh, or the food stamp program, and who has access to that. Well, beginning in 1996, the decision was made at the federal government level that if somebody was convicted of a drug-related felony, they would not have access to the food stamp program. That was turned into a state option, meaning each state could decide what to do with that law. Me in California, we thought, oh, you know, we're in a very democratic state, we've just elected Gray Davis, so we're gonna knock this one out of the park, right? Uh, it was, um, I can't remember her name, Catherine, uh, I can't remember her last name. She was a Republican, Kathy Wright. Right. She was a Republican state senator, Republican. So she said, let us repeal this in California. It got through the assembly in the Senate with maybe eight votes against it. Came to Governor Gray Davis, our big liberal progressive governor. And what did he say? He decoded it and said, convicted felons do not deserve the same rights as ordinary citizens. Mm -hmm. Exactly what Elena was saying about who decides who gets to be human. So for the past 15 years, Hunger Action LA is one of many groups and entities that have tried to overturn this ban. And we finally did succeed this year. But I want to tell you that we're back. <laughs> it took every bit of those 15 years and about six or seven separate bills, they were introduced repeatedly over and over. They would always be, end up being vetoed, one of them partially passed, that was signed by Governor Schwarzenegger, of all people. So this is something you learn in politics, it's the, it's the Nixon go, can go to China thing. You know, sometimes you can get someone with the supposed opposite philosophy to, to support something. But finally this year, uh, and it didn't even pass as a bill, for those of you familiar with the legislative process, it was put into the state budget. That's how they finally got rid of this. And a large role was played by an assembly member from South LA, uh, Reginald Jones Sawyer, and so let's give him a big hand because <laughs> So how did this impact people, this, uh, this being se separated out? After you've come out of prison, we're talking about the re-entry phase now. Not only did people not have access to food, uh, they, they're banned also at the time from the CalWORKs program, so there was no income for people. So for the same people who are now being put out, told they've done their time in prison, and now they're supposed to pick themselves up by their bootstraps and get back into society. There was no access to food or money during that time, the long extended period when they're looking for a job, which as you know, it's very easy to get a job if you have a past drug felony, right? I mean, it's a snap, they're just, they're just looking for people with, uh, you know, with, with that on their resume. So this had a definite impact on, on people's health, but it had a further impact on recidivism because when people weren't able to pick up the economic strings and, and carry on with a job because they couldn't even carry on with uh, survival money, um, they ended up back in prison where at least they got the three bologna sandwiches, which they couldn't do outside. Um, and it took away also from uh, people who had been breadwinners, both men and women, breadwinners and their family. Now you're not even able to bring home enough food for your family. There's nothing that cuts at someone lower than that. To be with uh, your loved ones, people who are supposed to look to you for, for their guidance and support and everything, and you're not even able to provide the simple meal on the table. So I want to just go over um, some of the reasons I think that we finally did overturn this, this unjust restriction on uh, people getting, getting food assistance. 
Uh, number one is that we involved people who were directly impacted, and it wasn't easy because, you know, in our organization, we, we do a lot of training for people who are low income who are impacted by a lot of poverty legislation. But to get someone to suddenly have the courage to go up and talk to a state assembly member and say, I had a drug felony, I'm, I'm just coming out, I'm having these problems, that takes an enormous amount of guts. Mm -hmm. But as time went by and people saw the example of others who were doing that, we, we started to pick up more people in, the, in that vein. The second is that we involved more people who were not affected. That was powerful as well. In the early days of, of this legislation, it wasn't a priority for a lot of people. They felt like it didn't impact that many people, or maybe some people subconsciously felt, you know, yeah, someone's a convicted felon, they brought it on themselves. But this last year, we collected, for example, 250 letters of support at the start of the legislative campaign season. They were looking at this, the bill, and they were saying, we've never seen this many letters of support come into Sacramento for a piece of legislation like this. We got churches on board. We got some of the usual suspects, you know, people who are working in the field of reentry, but we also got churches. We had probation officers talking about how difficult it was for them to help people reenter into society. So involving a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily be connected or wouldn't necessarily be sympathetic. The third thing I want to point out is that the work is not finished. Uh, this, this change actually won't be implemented until April 1st. And I'm sure hoping it doesn't turn out to be an April Fool's joke, because that's, <laughs> it's not going to be good. Um, so there's an opportunity for all of us to become involved in telling people. There are a lot of people who gave up looking for this kind of assistance because once they had tried and, and been rejected, they thought it, it was gone forever. They, they weren't aware that there was a, a big push to get a change. And then finally, it's a springboard for us to work on many other issues because it wasn't just, it wasn't just CalFresh and CalWorks that uh, even that people are currently barred from if they have a drug-related felony. It's public housing. Uh, it is the whole issue of employment that we've already mentioned. Uh, there's been a campaign to ban the box. There's been a talk of uh, a ban the box campaign on the county level, you know, to at least do it for county jobs. But it can go much broader than that. Um, all of this connects in with um, what Michelle Alexander talks about in her book, The New Jim Crow. This essentially is more Jim Crow legislation. Because even though it's not written against people of a particular ethnicity, that is the end result of it, is that it is disproportionately African Americans and behind them Latinos who are impacted by legislation that bars people from getting any kind of public assistance when they have a drug-related felony. So as we work on implementing this in April, we have the opportunity to educate other people about uh, what are some of the other things that people are barred from and to create some momentum in changing those things kind of springboard into it. And so that's uh, kind of what we're going to be talking about in our small group as well, is the reentry phase. I just want to mention one last thing about the reentry phase, and it, it kind of goes back, again, to what Angelina was saying about the food in prison. The food is very similar at a lot of the halfway houses, recovery homes, and places like that. And I have already seen, uh, you know, studies and research that shows that people coming out of addiction in particular need certain kinds of nutrients and they're not getting any kind of nutrients. It is the same bologna sandwiches they were getting in prison. There's a, a guy, a friend of ours, called us up and said, hey, we, we just had a friend who came out after a long time in prison. He is now at a halfway house, and he can't eat anything they have there because he became a vegetarian while he was in prison. Mm -hmm. and, now, and now at the recovery home, he can't get the kind of food that he needs to sustain himself. So these are some of the things we want to talk about going forward, and I'll, uh, I'll end it there. Fantastic. Thank you. heard about how we can begin to, to, to repair harm with folks who have been involved in the system, both in the system and now post-involvement in the system. Um, when we open up with uh, the, the beginning of this, this session today, we played a video. And that video uh, articulated that, that uh, every one out of three black males are expected to be incarcerated in his lifetime. And in considering that, we know that this has a huge impact on our communities, on our economies, on our school systems, and the like. And so there are those of us around here in our community working to interrupt this school to prison pipeline, and the cradle to prison pipeline. We're working diligently in the food system to create opportunities that open up, uh, 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 open up doors for these young men. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to play a video that talks about how we work to prevent 
harm from occurring in the first place. It's not recording. Yes, it is. It's really not. <laughs> it has record. <laughs> we flipped, you know, in our generation. We eat out every day of the week right. and maybe cook every now right. and then. Right. Total reversal. It's the total reversal. So if we go back to doing what our grandparents did, you know, more for, you know, you always had two, three vegetables mm -hmm. with dinner when grandma was cooking. Right. And all our folks didn't fight this hard for us to get to this point to find that the biggest threat to our children today could be their own health. I was watching TV the other day and I seen Michelle Obama's commercial for community gardens. And I was thinking to myself, the same thing that she was talking about, we were actually putting into effect. Educating the community about unhealthy foods and actually fixing the problem and supplying the community with healthy foods. Her words were we'll be putting into action through the Black Melody Academy. So these young men who became our first group of graduates said, you know, Mr. Scores, we want to do something to improve our community, right? We know what we're capable of, and we want to let the world know. One of the young men suggested doing a community garden. After going through the ideas, all the young men were like, you know, that's actually a pretty good idea. The community garden is important because it's giving the community an opportunity to eat healthy. Just in case they wasn't able to go down to the supermarket and be able to afford the vegetables and fruits that's in within the supermarket, they could go down to the community garden. So we got permission from the district and the administration, and then we broke rent. The garden. The garden. <laughs> Summertime. Last summer. That summer that just passed. All I was doing was the garden. Garden, garden, garden. <laughs> Hot, sweaty, pain in the back. The garden before we put all the work into it was nothing but a flat, big, desolate area with nothing but gravel and a big stone square in the middle. It's just like a bunch of cement crumbles and rocks everywhere and dirt. As they began to turn this land over and dig into this gravel, they started finding things like broken crack pipes. There was a lot of trash and broken bottles, cans, and, and knives on the site. And they were like, you know, we don't want this stuff in our community. We don't want crap pipes in our community. So they cleaned that lot up. They cleaned that space up. Do we had to break this concrete up, this solid piece of concrete. We had to dig around it and break it up. Moving the mulch around, watering, after digging. Then we start to level ground, start to have to use the axe. They got rid of that debris and turned it into paradise. These young men and the students in the school learned what they were capable of. They learned what they could do. It was just a big accomplishment because just to see that we can make that big of a change, it shows the community, like, if we can take that lot and turn it into a garden, what else can we change about the community? What else can we do to turn the community into a positive direction? Even though I was out there every day of my life, so I appreciate that. To ask us how we did it, how we can help them make that happen, because they were the first one to create a community garden. So it is good, huh? <laughs> Do you have a brother? I put everything in his work. He'll build that right here, a shed. He'll build a neck. He'll build his whole barn. just about repairing harm, but it's also about preventing harm from occurring in the first place. If we can do work in our communities, on the ground, with young folk in the food system, we can mitigate the school to prison pipeline. If there are opportunities for folk in our communities to return 
and help to grow their own food, address these issues related to diet, improve health, find jobs. We can address these challenges related to harm. We have less of a reason to incarcerate and more of a reason to lift people up. So we're going to open up for a brief discussion before we get into our breakout groups. And I'm going to turn to Annalena Frank now. You know, I'm going to ask you both um, to share what it means to restore justice in the food system. So from your perspective, from the work that you do, what does this mean? What does it mean to repair harm in the food system? Well, to me, you know, it, it goes back to what I was saying about that dignity of being able to bring home and provide for your family. It goes beyond just saying, hey, I've got, now I can have access to the right kind of food. But it's that you can feel human again. You can feel whole again. You've been separated out, segregated out, made to feel less than human, made to feel like an animal or even a machine at best. And now it's coming back into the human community. And instead of instead of always being on the underneath and looking to someone else who's telling you what to do and who's confining you to a space, it's it's giving birth to uh, the things that you want to do, your spirit, your own creativity. That's what makes us all human, really, is that, that core of creativity. So to me, that's what it means to restore justice, is nothing less than to be able to restore to people the ability to create and be a human being, a functioning human being. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that we have to think about is the systemic aspect of the food system, right? And the fact that, you know, there are vulnerable populations that are affected first and worst, but really it's about all of us who eat, you know, eat food and need clean air and water to survive, right? So it's, it's almost about reclaiming, or it is about reclaiming humanity from, you know, this kind of corporate person, you know, the, the corporate food systems that are delivering all of our food, right? So we live in this moment where we don't really question how the food even got to our table. You know, who slaughtered and processed this meat? You know, it wasn't me, so if I waste half of it, I don't really feel that connected to it, right? So it's almost like restoring, restoring justice to the food system to me is about like restoring my own and our own um, integrated role in the food system, in the production um, and cultivation and consumption of the food. And I think it's also about um, reclaiming and reframing the built environment because a lot of us who live in these urban centers we kind of just inherited the the way that the, the neighborhoods are set up right so if i go outside um and all i have access to is a gas station two liquor stores and you know a food for less then i'm gonna have a really hard time achieving the kind of health outcomes that that are ideal for me that are optimal for me right so it's almost about taking back those um those physical structures and, and the physical spaces that we live in, just like the video that you just showed us, taking back the spaces and really transforming them into, into ones that are beneficial for our livelihoods. Thank you. And then building upon that, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to think about the ways in which these um, conditions impact all of us, right? So so why does it matter? Why, why does it matter that we all sort of take ownership over these issues of justice and their equity? Because when things are, are ignored, they turn into scabs that eventually cut in, in, in bleeding. And that's what we're seeing in Ferguson, for example. It's, it's neglect. You can't just say one group uh, to another group can't just say, okay, you've got your civil rights now, now we're just not going to pay attention to you. We're just going to pretend like you're not there. That's kind of what has happened all over America, even though a lot of us, it's very uncomfortable to admit it that that's what's happened. But that is seriously it. It's, it's about... Uh, it's about neglect. So we have to stop <coughs> neglecting each other. We have to reach out. You know, something you said about integrating our, all of our role in the food system, we've sort of defaulted on that. We, we've let, you know, these, these big corporations and big ag take that over. But, you know, the more we take that, take that back in, and, uh, for example, everyone here in this room is interested in food to some degree. And, and came here because they're interested in food to some degree. But some of the people we need to reach out to, to places where this awful food is being served, they're not here in the room. How do we eventually get them in the room, or how do we, who are here, create something that we can involve them in so that they're thinking in the same way? And, and that people realize you don't have to be an expert. The fact that you eat involves you in this food system. Mm -hmm. Right, and we also have to think longitudinally, right? So the work that we're doing right now is for several generations out. I want my grandchildren to be able to eat food that's not been genetically modified, right? I want 
my grandchildren to be able to, you know, have oxygen and rivers and things mm -hmm. that my mother and grandmother's generation were like, these are just part of our natural environment, right? But these are things that are under extreme threat now from these, you know, industrialized kind of corporate entities that are coming down and taking claim in things that used to be part of the commons, right? So the patenting of seeds and life are things that we'll start to see in, in you know, at an accelerated rate, but especially when you start thinking down the line to where, you know, in, in developing countries and in this country, you won't be able to get a seed that Monsanto has not stamped its, you know, its logo on, on the inside and the outside. So now, some would argue that the industrial food system has allowed for us to make it hungry, right? It's allowed for us to feed people. Right? In many ways, California has been considered the breadbasket of the nation. The United States has been considered the breadbasket of the world. Others would even argue that you know it's not the fault of our farmers. Right? They they're not they, they're subject to an economic system that devalues their work as well. So if we're thinking about what it takes to restore justice across this food system, right? Where do we begin? Where do we where do we start that work? It's hard to say where to start because what's happened is we've increased quantity at the cost of quality. The industrial food system is putting more substances on people's plates. Whether you want to call it food or not depends on what your, your definition of food is. So I think it, it has to start with each one of us individually, and it's, and it's tough. You know, if we're, if we're used to grabbing the thing from McDonald's because it's right there and we don't have time, and we never learn how to, how to fix up something even, even really quick with vegetables in it, it's just going to take longer and longer. You're not going to be as interested in changing the food system unless you're actually changing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's scary how quickly that transformation occurred. It's only been like, what, 50 or 60 years mm -hmm. that is, we've really been living under that kind of system. Absolutely. And I also think it's really about decentralizing and demonopolizing the mm -hmm. industrial food system, right? So it's not, I don't place blame on the farmers. I'm thinking more along the lines that, you know, everyone's trying to do what they think that they need to do to survive, but what we're doing instead of you know having these kind of local and, and integrated food systems is we're planting monocultures. So all I'm growing is cotton or soybeans or corn because it's a cash crop. And then with that cash, I go then buy food. And the logic of that just doesn't make any sense, right? So on the one hand, industrial food systems have produced more substances, right? But it's also just kind of prolonged its own existence, right? So Walmart coming in to address food insecurity is in Walmart's own best interest. It's not because Walmart wants my family to be healthy, right? It's because Walmart wants my money, so. Fantastic. Well, it's been such a pleasure having a conversation with you both today. Um, we're gonna now transition to our groups and you actually can continue to have this conversation.